Uh, and I want to speak uh, just for a few more minutes here this afternoon about uh, National Police Week. This is a week to honor our fallen law enforcement officers. It, it occurs next week. Next week here in Washington, D.C., uh, we will see police vehicles from all over the nation. We will see officers in uniform, perhaps some with, with young kids in tow, flooding the metro system. The survivors of law enforcement tragedies will gather in Alexandria, Virginia for the annual meeting of Concerns of Police Survivors. And then on Tuesday night, tens of thousands will gather at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial and they will read by candlelight the names inscribed on the memorial walls this year. On Thursday, the National Peace Officers Memorial Service will convene on the west front of the Capitol. These are all very moving um, tributes to, to our fallen, uh, those who have served in the line of duty and who honor us all. Now, for the past 11 years, I've made it a habit of honoring the fallen during National Police Week, and this is regardless of whether or not we have seen any Alaska law enforcement uh, who have suffered a line of duty death during that preceding year. At times, I have made note of a sad coincidence, a sad coincidence that law enforcement tragedies in the twos and threes often seem to occur in close proximity to the annual Police Week observance. About this time eight years ago, the National Capital Region was grieving the loss of Michael Garbiano and Vicki Armel, the first Fairfax County police officers to die from gunfire in the line of duty. In April 2009, Pittsburgh lost three of its finest. And this year, as we anticipate the arrival of National Police Week, Alaska carries that tragic burden. Last week, my home state lost two members of the Alaska State Troopers in a single incident. Mr. President, I note that the Majority Leader is on the floor. Did you wish? Thank you. Thank you. Last week, we lost two members of the Alaska State Troopers in a single incident. On May 1st, Alaska State Trooper Sergeant Scott Johnson and Trooper Gabe Rich flew from Fairbanks to the village of Tanana. Tanana is an Athabascan Indian community. There's about 238 people. Uh, Tanana sits at the confluence of the Yukon and Tanana rivers. It is, a, it is a strong community. It's a resilient community. Um, but it is a community that is truly suffering right now. Like most of Alaska Native Villages, the only full-time law enforcement presence in Tanana is a single, unarmed village public safety officer. Law enforcement backup, when they're needed, when they're called in, they will fly to Tanana. Tanana is not accessible by road, so basically the only way in and out is to fly in and out coming in from Fairbanks, so it's about an hour flight away. The village public safety officer asked for trooper assistance to, uh, to respond to an individual who had, had been waving a gun in the village. And with no backup other than the unarmed village um, public safety officer, Sergeant Johnson and Trooper Risch attempted to serve a warrant on the offender. Both officers were shot and killed. The son, the 20-year-old son of the individual who was the subject of the warrant, is now charged with the shooting. This is a horrible tragedy for Tanana, a tragedy for Alaska, and a tragedy for the entire law enforcement community. Tanana is a, um, as I mentioned, it is a small village. It's an isolated village. It's been a very resilient village. It's a very proud and a very kind-hearted community. Uh, the, the Athabascan word for Tanana means wedding of the rivers, and it's played a very central role in Athabascan culture for, for really thousands of years. 
But like many of Alaska Native villages, it suffers from drug and alcohol problems. Last October, there was a group of, of young people from the village of Tanana, and they traveled to the Alaska Federation of Natives uh, Convention. This is the largest gathering of Alaska Natives in the state. And they did a very brave and heroic thing, Mr. President. They assembled on, on stage in front of four or 5,000 people to tell Alaskans that they had had enough of the pain and the violence and they were determined to make their community a healthier place. It was an amazing moment. It was inspiring. There was not a sound to be heard in the huge uh, center there in, in Fairbanks as these young people spoke. So inspiring were the words of these young kids that I wrote Attorney General Holder, and I asked that his department invest prevention resources in the village and others like it, that were trying to turn things around, trying to face the, the ugly side of, of what happens in a small community when you have uh, domestic violence, child sexual assault brought on by, by drugs and alcohol. Tanana is absolutely devastated by what happened last week. In the words of Cynthia Erickson, who is the youth leader of the, the young people that I mentioned, last week's incident amounts to two steps back in Tanana's effort to heal itself. But the healing process must begin, and now is the time for it to begin. We remember fallen law enforcement officers for the way that they lived their lives. It's been said, and it was Vivian Annie Cross, who is the widow of a fallen U.S. Capitol Police officer, that said, it's not how these officers died that made them heroes, it's how they lived. And in that spirit, I would like to share with the Senate a little bit, very briefly, about the lives of these two Alaskan heroes. Sergeant Johnson, he was born in Fairbanks. He grew, in the, grew up in the small community of, of Toke, which is 100 plus 150 plus miles out of, out of Fairbanks on the road system. He went to school in the Tote community. He was a wrestler. He joined the Alaska State Troopers in 93 after serving as a North Slope Borough police officer. Sergeant Johnson spent his entire 20 year trooper career in Fairbanks where he rose through the ranks to supervise the area wide narcotics team and ultimately the interior rural unit. Sergeant Johnson was also an accomplished canine handler and leader of the regional SWAT team. We call it CERT in Alaska, the Special Emergency Reaction Team. His final assignment was leader of the Interior Rural Unit, a team of four that responds to incidents in 23 native villages. Sergeant Johnson assumed that role just this year in 2014. His territory covered hundreds of miles end to end, and again, these are hundreds of miles without road access. Sergeant Johnson was 45 years old. He survived by his wife, daughters ages 16, 14, and 12, also survived by his parents and siblings. And then Trooper Gabe Rich was born in Pennsylvania. He moved to Fairbanks shortly after he was born. He graduated from Lathrop High School in 2006. He was 26 years old at the time of his death. Trooper Rich spent four years working as a patrolman with the North Pole Police Department before deciding to become an Alaska State Trooper in 2011. He survived by his fiance, their one-year-old son, and his parents. He was in the process of adopting his fiance's eight-year-old boy. Sergeant Johnson and Trooper Rich were known to those who watch the popular geographic series, Alaska State Troopers. Undoubtedly, those who have watched the two in action are also grieving the loss, along with the people of Tanana and all of Alaska. I think I speak for all in this body when I say that we are shocked, we are saddened by the events in Tanana last week. And on behalf of a grateful Senate, a grateful nation, I take this opportunity to extend my condolences to all who held Sergeant Johnson and Trooper Rich deep in their hearts. With that, uh, Mr. President, I thank you for your attention and I yield the floor.